first of all, thanks so much for the help the other day. That was so fun to have you live with those guys. And I know they enjoyed it too. As I said, only you can inspire 700 people to care about a Borham Berlian <laughs> ratio. Um, so I, I've gotten into the weeds with your posters and uh, a couple of other things. And my first question is, did I read that correctly on one of those posters? Over 20 years, you've, you've uh, worked with 30 different sites, 30 different pluton or volcanic uh, suites. In terms, of, in terms of dating, you mean? Or, yes, or, or the petrology or both? Well, we've um, probably done about eight class projects. Wow. And each of those was a different place. So yeah. the story has been, has been built largely through class projects and then many class projects have turned into theses. So there's probably another um, twice that number. You know, some students have, have done projects that involved sampling a large number of units, but not mapping them. So there's there's about 35 new, uh, new uranium lead dates. That's great. Cumulative um, that pertain to this. And this all started 20 years ago ish, as soon as you started at UPS? Pretty soon. I was looking for a, a place to take petrology class outdoors, and it was spring semester, so the weather was you know, miserable and we couldn't really go to the Cascades. So oh. Ken Clark said, I think I saw this horn blend bearing rock in the Olympics like. 30 years ago when I was doing my master's thesis. And so I thought we should go look at that. And so sure enough, up this brushy creek, and there were these horn blend bearing rocks. And I'd never heard of an adakite, but it turned out that's what they were. So it's continued ever since. And is at 30,000 feet looking down on the last 20 years then with all these student projects and posters and theses, um, how has the, the scope of this evolved to the point now where you're seeing a rollback and you're seeing break off belt and you're seeing implications with Northwest tectonics? I assume in the first few projects, you weren't thinking regionally at all necessarily, or were you? No, I don't think so. <clears throat> I, I had never heard of the chalice event either. Oh, wow. So I, 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 yeah. I came here having done my dissertation in Cascades. Yeah. And my intent was to work in the Cascades. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's not as friendly terrain wise. And so it was, was this discovery in the, in, in the Olympics that turned out to be Eocene, sort of opened the door to studying the Eocene. And that then spread east. So we went and walked as far west east as Idaho. And then the time frame kept shrinking back oh. toward the Cascades. Yeah. So the, um, and so now, you know, here at the end of my career, I'm back in the Cascades and the whole story has formed this loop that yeah. in which an arc disappeared and this chalice event erupted and then the arc reappeared, so. Well, I, it's, it's amazing, it's fun, it uh, is perfect for the kinds of things that I've been doing with uh, my classes where we, we learn um, some specifics about a local place, but then I love the part about plugging into a, a bigger right. picture. And, and this, is, this is like ideal for that, obviously. Um, can you, one more thing from this Goodyear blimp version, then we'll, we'll dive into a couple of details. Um, are there pretty clear opposing camps uh, with the tectonic interpretation of your data or somebody else's? Like there's the spreading ridge people and they, they only want a subducting spreading ridge in a slab window versus you and some others who are like, for sure you've got to roll back and break offs or are there people who are- Oh, well, swinging back I, I think there are, there are questions about how far this story extends geographically. So, you know, north of the border, is that a different story or is that the same story, but with some different um, parameters? And then how far does it go to the south? Yeah. So those, those things, um, 
remain to be resolved, I would say. And when I worked on, began working on this with Mike Eddy and Bob Miller and Paul Umhofer, um, it was all about slab windows. Oh. And so all of us go into this thinking, you know, how does the subduction of a spreading ridge affect the geology farther inboard? Mm -hmm. And then partway along the line, then I started to start to be data, particularly with, you know, with Mike's dates and then dates that we collected that were beginning to be hard to reconcile with anything that's moving north and south. So then this will have break off the rollback story. And then, so then, you know, the first dating that we did was designed to test the uh, slab window hypothesis. And so we, we chose a transect of samples to date that was sort of northwest to southeast. And that would be perfect for tracking something that's moving along the margin. Does that make sense? Well, no, it doesn't. So that, that's one thing I wanted to talk about. So I, I. Um... All right, let's try this. Go ahead. Here's the margin. Yeah. There's a subducting spreading ridge. And this would be under the continent over here. Yes. Okay, if it's moving north, then you're, you'd be interested in some transect of dates that would record a younging in this direction. Younging to the north or even northwest would right. Yeah, younging, yeah. I'm not, I'm, you know, this is reversed in my view, so I'm not sure where you're doing great, is. man. No, you're, you're, you're putting it on a silver right. platter right now. All I'm saying is if the spreading ridge were doing something like this, yes, you'd be getting an age progression that's going younger in this direction. Okay. Yes. Uh-huh. And and so in the real world, that would be to the northwest. Got it. I have no idea what its orientation is to you at the moment. It's perfect. But the point is you would choose to, to date a series of rocks along a transect that was something oriented sort of like that. And that's what you tried doing initially or not? Right. And that's what we tried doing initially. Okay. But can you imagine that that is the worst possible transect if something yes. is doing this? Yes. So we didn't, you know, we didn't really figure out in the first round of dating that there was any kind of pattern. Let me pause you. Uh, geographically, what was that transect? Let's say going northwest, uh, just a couple. So, of like places. from from Medical Lake. Okay. Medical Lake up toward um, oh, Golden Horn or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So from I ninety basically up to North Cascades Park. Right. More or less. Something like that. So. That's the worst possible orientation if something's moving from northeast to southwest. It's like you've, you've dated along a con, an isochron line, an iso, you know, contour of, of constant right. age. And that's what you saw. You saw the same ages all, all the way up there. Well, we didn't. We didn't see. Us, you know, it was all Eocene, but it, you know, and then it just it didn't. At that point, we we still thought it was a slab window, and so the question was was not so much whether there was an age pattern as um, well it still fit with that story. And we thought maybe we just, um, we don't have a tight enough age resolution to see something that's moving at the rate that a, a spreading ridge would move up the margin. Then once we started thinking, well, maybe this is actually rollback. So I had another student and we, this time we dated stuff starting in Idaho and moving to the Southwest. And uh, so you know, we went to University of Arizona. We date all these things in this marathon, you know, laser session. And we, you, know, you don't really know when, when you leave there if you have an answer. You know, you have dates, but you don't have time to put them on a map and see how they fit. Right. And I think it, um, the one thing I remember is that I glanced at the data and I I couldn't see any pattern. I thought, oh, bummer. And then we, I think we met on a Saturday morning and I, you know, we looked at the data and I suddenly realized you have to throw out all the ages that are more than 52 because those are just cluttering up the story and they're not part of the, the rollback. And once you took those out, everything else was just whoosh, to ah, the Southwest. Yeah. And so ah. it's like you know, one of these like epiphany breakthrough moments that I will never forget. So. And you were thinking, was it, it's a chicken or egg thing 
which came first, the idea of a potential rollback or that? Um, I think the idea of, of a, a break off and rollback um, inspired to go back to Northeastern Washington and, and date more, but this time change the distribution of, of sampling sites to be broader and to explicitly include sites that would allow us to see if there had been a progression to the Southwest. And is it pushed, I should ask Mike this directly, I guess this summer, but is it pushing it too much to say, uh, since Mike did not see the original age progression of I-90 up to the North Cascades getting younger, that got him thinking that maybe this is not a northward uh, migrating triple junction and, and he started thinking about the opposite. We've been- I don't know that. I don't, I think, I think, you know, Mike is, sees the big picture and, and integrates a lot more, you know, data from other places and other, other types of data. So the dates that we got um, initially, and those, you know, those were done in, in Arizona, uh, not at, not at MIT. So M Mike wasn't part of that dating. I see. And I don't remember if I, mean, I think I shared the numbers with him, but um, I, I think his idea about southward migration is is not based on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is great. I'm loving it. Thank you. Let me go to a couple specifics that I could use some help. And then I, I've got plenty, you know, I, I've got a, a game plan for both Tuesday and Thursday. And when we start on Tuesday, I'll do a quick recap of what we did last time, which was, we have now evidence, thanks to Jeff's work of a hot and dry chalice magma system. And we, we got into the details there. We didn't get into why we thought those were deep magnets. And so as I'm reading, I guess my message, you can help, you can steer me a little bit, but my guess, my message is we're generating these chalice magmas in the deep crust, not the mid crust, not the shallow crust. We're creating deep uh, crustal melts because we're uh, fl uh, getting mantle to, to flow upward and trigger that. How do you know that those magmas are being formed in the lower crust? So um, when the crust is more than 30 kilometers thick, yep. then plagioclase becomes unstable. So if you had, a, so I think the lower crust is probably basaltic in composition texture wise or mineralogically it's like it'd be a gabbro okay so it's a coarse grained rock but it has the composition of basalt or something similar just normally in a continental crust you would have a gab because these are all these are all you know accreted arc terrains so in an arc you have a lot of, of magma coming out of the mantle but it doesn't all reach the surface a lot of it will, will be ponded at the um, crust mantle boundary Okay. And so that's called underplating when you add yeah. magma to the base of the crust. And what you're adding is basalt. Okay. So if, if the crust is less than 30 kilometers thick, you'll get gabbro down there. But if it's more than 30 kilometers thick, pelagioclase is no longer a stable mineral and it becomes, an, a, the rock becomes an eclogite. And when you melt an eclogite, you get a different signature than if you melt a gabbro. I'm sorry, I was distracted by the cat. Uh, <laughs> eclogite. Okay. All right. So when you when you when you melt a rock to produce a magma, yeah, it never melts a hundred percent. You okay. always leave something behind. Okay. And what is left behind is different if you have different minerals present in the first place. So if, if you are melting a rock that's made of plagioclase and pyroxene, for example, like a gabbro, you will leave behind some elements that are retained in the minerals that don't melt. And those retained elements are different if you're melting a gabbro. Mm. 
versus melting an equijite. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is, so it's like a fingerprint. It's a yeah. chemical fingerprint that tells you what was being melted. And in a lot of these Eocene rocks, the fingerprint says this was melting equijite. So the, the, there's thicker than usual crust and more melting of crust than normal because it was hotter than usual. How thick was the crust in Eastern Washington or is it? Um, well, it's, it's thinner. So there was a, um, as a result of terrain accretion, there was a thickened sort of plateau in what is today Eastern Washington. And so there's been you know, kilometers and kilometers of exhumation and erosion since then yeah so these magmas you know today the crust is 35 kilometers thick or whatever but but at that time it might have been 50 or you know, 60 or something so these are these are things that are coming out of crust that was 50 or 60 kilometers down okay and that is in the stability field of this of, of this rock eclogite but there's nothing in the chalice magmas today, plutonic or volcanic, that's eclogite. There's not. Like no, no. And so eclogite's not a stable rock type at the Earth's surface. I mean, it, we find it, but it's, it's metastable. I mean, if you remelted it and allowed it to crystallize again, it would crystallize as basalt. Okay. Um, along these lines, then. Did you emphasize that the breakoff belt is pretty strongly bimodal compared to the rest of the chalice, which are just generally rollback? Um, yes, I would say that is true. And, and part of the reason for, for making note of the fact that it's bimodal is that that also helps us to distinguish those rocks from the other rocks in the Cascades because the breakoff belt is another one of these linear features yeah. like yeah. an arc. And it has more, it doesn't have exactly the same trend as the modern Cascades, but right. it's, it's not dramatically different. So those rocks are interspersed with rocks of the modern Cascades. And recognizing that they're not part of the modern Cascades is partly based on dating, but also partly recognized on the fact that unlike a typical arc, which is basalt, anisite, dacite, rhyolite, this whole spectrum, these rocks are just basalt and then tufts and, and highly felsic and rhyolites and things, and nothing in between. And the interpretation of that is that the basalt is the product of mantle upwelling through a tear in the slab. And when mantle rises, it's going to melt spontaneously. And then those hot magmas trigger melting in the crust and that produces the rhyolite. So you have a situation where you've got an anomalously hot and abundant basalt coming into the crust. And, and I would, I guess, speculate that because this is a somewhat of a tensional setting, mm -hmm. it's easier for these basalts to get to the surface without having sat around for a while in the lower middle crust and, and crystallizing. So you don't wind up with andesite, the kinds of rocks that you typically get if oh. basalt is stalled on the way to the surface. I like that. So the, it's there, we're talking about essentially the presence of intermediate magmas. The intermediate magmas are in the cascade arc, subduction. They're mm -hmm. in the, um, well, they are kind of in their rollback chalice. They're, they're there too, yeah, because we're in, in most of that rollback stuff is melting of the crust, not melting of the mantle. There's mantle melting happening, but those rocks are having a hard time getting to the surface because the crust was very thick. And once you start to melt the crust, it's hard to get through it anymore. Okay, so if, if crust is cold and brittle, you can fracture it and have dikes and waves to get to the surface. But once it starts to get hot and gooey, then it's hard for magmas to get through it. Mm. 
So if we started in Eastern Washington with an unusually thick crust as a product of, of earlier terrain collisions yeah. and then heated up a bunch, it's hard for anything that was coming out of the mantle to get to the surface. Instead, it stalls out somewhere along the way. It triggers a bunch of melting. <clears throat> Those melts of crustal composition are less dense. They can get to the surface more easily. So <clears throat> and again, because they're hot and dry, that also makes it easier for them to get to the surface. That's great. And I, I'm going to have a hard time synthesizing that for tomorrow. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I can, I hope you're okay with me posting this because I think getting it directly from you is going to be a, a okay. great help kind of maybe after tomorrow's lecture or something like that. I don't know. Um, so I'm going to watch that one a couple more times and replay what you just said. I've got part of it, I think. Uh, so the timing, before I even show you what I have, so break off number one and break off number two, you're still liking two distinct break off events. I think that's inescapable okay. because in order for rollback to take place, right. the farther east end has to be detached. From yes. Maryland slab has, has gone all the way under North America and right. part that's under Ohio is not rolling back. Yeah. So okay. we have to have a disconnect between the part that rolled back, which I would say is, is probably um, Gene Humphrey's curtain. I don't know if you've talked about that. Uh, that's part of tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's a you know a slice, yeah. which has a top bottom and a top. And I yeah. think those one break off took place here and one break off took place here because it's detached at both ends. And so slab number one, just instinctively, numbers for you, 53 to 51, 54 to 50, whatever. What? Break off number one. Yeah. I would say, you know, before 53. And I haven't read this paper recently, but there are, you know, there's a lot of unusual magmatism, uh, really deep melting stuff happening in the mid-continent around that time. So the place, I I was, that, the place I was willing to go was the Montana alkali. Yeah, but even Denver. farther east than that, there's, okay. there's some weird, I think, um, I haven't read this for a while, so yeah, I'm, I don't want to say too much about what uh, I don't remember, but. Um, but that break was. So that I'm break. Use Montana, you know, as opposed to yeah, Idaho, fine. you know, you know, it's. Right. Uh, but it's the Idaho slab now. Wait, no, hold it, hold it. I'm ahead of my story. Let, let me just keep. So so greater than 53. That's what we'll say for the At first point. There was a break off event which allowed rollback to begin. Right, right. That's the whole reason, yes. Right. And so then, rollback is, is a response to Celestia approaching the margin, which is inhibiting subduction. Um, hang on. No, I'll get to it. Um, OK. And then the second break, which is the more second. important to us in class because we've been visiting the Tiana Way right. and a couple other things. Right. Uh, right. That's 51 to 48. Yes, I mean, th that's the ages that we would see in that belt. So I would say that, you know, we don't have a systematic age progression from north to south, for example. So I can't say that it was like a zipper that tore. Right. So, yeah, so there, it does seem like you know, the older ages are at the north end. So the Oso, you know, 51.6, but in the middle there, not on your handout is Silver Pass, mm -hmm. which, would, which fits in there, but is, was not part of the story at that time. And Silver Pass is 51.3, I think. So yeah, all of, you know, I think all of these volcanic centers have a span of ages. And we don't know if we've sampled the oldest date you know, in any particular place. So we don't really know when turn, like you would like, I guess, to think that the earliest activity at any given place is the age you would use if you were trying to see if there was a pattern. But we don't have enough time spread 
to see that. So I think all we can say is that in that window between 51.5 or something and 48-ish. Okay, good. Break off took place. And that encompasses the span of time that Mike's data would say is, is when, uh, and, and Ray Wells' data would say is when Celestia was actually completed its accretion. Good, I got two more things. Okay. Are you meaning that this is the edge of the surface exposures of Celestia? Are you truly saying no. there's no Celestia below this? Because right. I thought there was, I thought we now have some geophysical evidence that Celestia is in the subsurface, like crossing over towards Ellensburg, essentially. Have you heard um, I, If so, I don't know that. that. I got that from a paper by Trehu. Okay. It's, it's based on geophysics. Okay. But it's, you know, the idea that you rammed this thick mass of basalt under the edge of the continent, but it only can only go so far. Yes. Now it would still have been attached to the Farallon or the Kula plate up until the place where the break off took place. So there could be. So I don't know if it matters, but. Uh... I'm using Andy Miner here locally and a couple others. Right. Who are, I don't know what the detailed papers they're using, but they, they've got the cascades kind of coming up through this Celestia in the subsurface. And I don't know how that affects the break off. Because you, your second break off is you're emphasizing that it's paralleling that edge of former Celestia. Well, I think so. I mean, it, that, I know, that looks like an interesting coincidence to me that right. this belt right. trends off to the northwest. Yeah. And that subsurface extent um, comes from geophysics. So it's a totally different source of data. Right. But the lines are fairly parallel. Okay. I like it. Okay, I'm saving the best for last. I still don't know what the hell to do with Adakites. I, uh, you helped me last time when we did the Zoom thing, you helped me see that the Adakites are melting of the actual slab down there and maybe we're at the edge of a tear or the edge of a root spreading center or something, like we're nibbling away at the corner of right. some plate that's right. down there. Right. But how, how are you using the Adakites? Are you using the Adakites with your story and how are you doing it? What's the role of them? So the... Hopefully this will not be a, a quick descent into a Kimberlite pipe, but. <laughs> hey, good one. All right, so adakite is the mag type of magma that you get if you've melted an eclogite. Oh, well, shit, we're back to that, okay. Yeah. Okay, now, so an eclogite is a basalt that's at high pressure. Okay. The subducting oceanic plate will become eclogite as it descends deeper into the mantle. So when you, when you, you know, first subduct it, it's, it's a metamorphosed basalt, but as it goes deeper and the pressure increases, it will transform into eclogite. So Wanda, if you could play today is an eclogite at X number of depth? Correct. Okay. So once it gets, once it gets below about 30 kilometers depth, it's gonna to transition to eclogite. Okay. So as an interesting aside, eclogite is a very dense rock. Okay. It's denser than the mantle. And so that transition causes the plate to become denser. And that's why it starts pulling the rest of the plate downward. Very cool. So this process of slab pull, which is part of what makes the whole system go, that takes place because the subducted plate has become eclogite and that's denser than the mantle. So the sub subducted slabs are weighted at the bottom. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Never heard that. Which is, which, which is also what would drive break off because if you've got something heavy at one end pulling, but you've got resistance up at the surface from buoyancy, something has to give and it's the plate. So you get a tear. Okay. Okay. So when you see a magma at the surface, which has the characteristics of an, of an, of an adakite, you know you've melted an eclogite. OK. 
Okay. And in a subduction zone, the, the most obvious candidate for what's being melted is the subducting plate. But normally that is cold because it's been sitting on the sea floor for millions of years. So it, in the normal subduction zone, the plate doesn't melt. So where we use this is if we start seeing adakites, we say, all right, well, that tells us that conditions in the subduction zone were unusually hot. And the situations in that would, which that could be true are really two. One, if the subducting plate is very young, or two, if you're at the edge of the plate where hot, mantle from below is, is burning at it like a blowtorch. And if you have a slab window, that's exactly the scenario there. So if you have a subducted spreading ridge, it's opening, magma is coming up through it, but the edge is there, that hot, hot upwelling mantle is impinging upon eclogite and melting it. So up above then, you're gonna get eight attacks. So when I, this is great. So when I said last time, do I take adakites and think spreading ridges, you kind of went, eh, not exactly. Well, so, I would, so I would say there is no fundamental difference between a subducted spreading ridge and a torn slab. In both cases, you have a gap in the slab, which allows hot, right. deeper mantle to cause melting. So the, the challenge is once you've recognized based on the presence of adakites that unusually hot conditions were present, well, why, is, why was that? And that's where some kind of dating and spatial pattern to magmatism would be helpful because in the case of the Northwest, I think the age distribution associated with a migrating slab window or spreading ridge is almost perpendicular to what you'd get from slab rollback. So if you have a, a spreading ridge, and I don't really care whether it's moving north or south, I personally think it was moving north, but in either case, the age progression is gonna be younger in some direction that's more or less parallel to the margin. You should see a north or south uh, younging. Right. If you're a, Migrating a, slab window person, migrating right, triple right, traction person. Right, right. And, and that's that's totally clearly that's clearly seen in you know in Alaska and coming you know south right. down. Right, Alaska's got the. I don't yep, know that. Got yeah, that is exactly what you see if you've got a spreading ridge moving along the margin. Are these Ada kites? Um, some of them are, but I don't think they all are. But they're just unusual four arc. You know, very close magmatism close to the trench, which is normally a cold place, not a place of melting. Yeah. And so not to name names, but you know, Madsen and others are, and even uh Fuston with the resurrection story, weren't they saying there was a similar age progression uh along the margin down here in the northwest? You may be rusty on what they're saying, but I I thought they were making it clear there was a nice uh, younging to the north from Washington yeah, from, from, BC or something, but I don't see that. Well, there, there is, I think there is um, among rocks in Silesia, there is some age progression from down around the California border northward. But there's, there's that is, you know, there's a problem in that you know, we have yet be careful where you are in the stratigraphic section when you're measuring an age, because if you're measuring high in the section in one place and low in another, you're gonna get a younger age, but that doesn't, those are not equivalent um, ones marking the onset of magmatism and the other ones telling you how long it lasted. Those are not exactly the same question. So yeah. I think, um, I think there is some indication in Silesia that there was a younging to the north. 
and then possibly an olding to the north if you got to onto the other side of the spreading ridge. Yeah, yeah. So if, you, if the if the ridge was doing this, you'd expect to see older ages away from it in both directions. So I guess that's how we can quit with one last question. Is it an either or thing or can you combine somehow the subducting spreading ridge and the rollback? Oh yeah, no, I think you should almost have to. All right, so let's roll back. Oh wait, let me, so is, is that what, well you kind of have the, yeah, okay, so. Yeah, all right, so. I think of rollback as like your hands just doing this. Right. Okay, so we, we've already we've already detached under Montana. So your fingers are free to roll back. Yep. But there's got to be some limit north and south to what's rolling back. Because the Farallon plate. You know, was an enormous plate and extended, you know, well, all into California. And we don't think that there's rollback happening in California. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a north and a south boundary to this portion that's rolling back. And I think slab windows are a way to, to make that boundary because a slab window is already a place where there's a gap in the slab. But that gap is perpendicular to the trench. All right, so can you see this? And that's oh, your look at that. And there's one slab window, and there's the other. Wow. And this broke off. So I think the slab window, the Kula Farallon slab window in the drawings that Ken made, that is the southern boundary of the rollback. Southern boundary, okay. So what's actually rolling back is the Kula. And the Farallon, which was to the south of that, is moving northward along the margin. And that's gonna slide in to take the place of Kula. And that's how the cascades are reestablished. Does somebody have some money to hire Jenda Johnson to make a nice animation to show all of that happening at the same time? Because I, I think I have two thirds of it. And then, for instance, the spreading ridge is migrating north at the same time. And boy, I have a hard time. So I, I think, you know, just to finish your question, if we had a resurrection plate, I don't know, did you talk about that? We did. All right, so there'd be a boundary between the Kula and the resurrection. Yeah. And that would be your other boundary to the rollback. And that's somewhere around the Canadian border. Hmm. So it is both a slab window or ridge subduction and rollback story. And you probably would have a hard time having rollback if you didn't have some kind of a window or something, a weak zipper in the subducting slab. So this is not necessarily what I thought it might be, which is competing groups and somebody like saying, there's no rollback here. You're high, Jeff. I don't know what you're looking at. This is entirely a migrating spreading ridge and that's it. They're all kind of seeing, you're all kind of on the same page-ish. I would like to think that, <clears throat> you know, I, I guess, you know, one of the um, facts of life is if you haven't published it except in posters, not everybody's seen it yet. So I haven't necessarily, you know, faced the full wrath of the, whatever the other camp is, but I would argue that it, it's pretty hard to refute the age progression. Good, good. So. And you're continuing with this summer collecting a few more samples, Wenatchee uh, area, and uh, maybe even beyond that, you'll continue to. Oh, so we're going to work at Silver Pass this summer. Yeah. So I have one student at Silver Pass and one student at um, in Wenatchee. 
After that, I'm not sure. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. It would depend on willing students who want to work on a petrologic project. So. Yeah. Well, it's great stuff, and it's a great way to finish this class, and everybody's totally jazzed about it. And uh, so um, it's great cool. to share what you've been doing, for sure. And, uh, well, I'll look for that paper sometime soon, huh? Coming to a theater <laughs> near you. Geologically soon. <laughs> yeah, okay.